All right, I have a lot to say. We're in 1 Corinthians 8. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus transformed a man's life. His name at the time was Saul. The most unlikely candidate for Christianity was the man named Saul. He was a great persecutor of the church. In fact, in Galatians, he uses a mafia term in the old King James. I wasted the church. That's a mafia term. But then he met the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He met the great head of the church. And his life was changed forever. He went on his first missionary journey, establishing churches. And then he started on his second missionary journey. He went to this place called Corinth. It's a seaport. Corinth, beautiful Corinth, but it was a very immoral city. So many lost people there. But the gospel, the gospel is the power. There's nothing so dark that the gospel can't penetrate the darkness of sinful human beings. And right amidst, in the midst of Corinth, Paul took the gospel. He had been very disappointed at Athens. Very disappointed. Because I think what he tried to do, this is speculation, but I think, because I don't know, I'm not inside a man's head, but it seemed like what he tried to do, he tried to use philosophy to kind of attract people and go head to head with the Stoics, and it didn't work. He was totally disappointed. Well, guess where he went right after that? Corinth. What did he say in the first chapter? I wanted to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the message of the church. Jesus Christ and him crucified and buried and resurrected. And then Paul started this church. Well, really, he didn't start it. No man could start a church. Only the Holy Spirit can start a church. But he starts it. He uses people. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. And Paul preached, and the Holy Spirit worked, and people were saved, truly converted. And this church in Corinth started. Paul calls them in the first chapter saints. Many of them were very godly, but there's a great portion of the church that was still very carnal. In fact, they were actually going the wrong way. They, they, would actually, they, they took the message and started mixing philosophy with it. And then because of Gnosticism and probably some Greek philosophy, they were, they were living ungodly lives and think, thought that was compatible with Christianity. And Paul, his heart broke and he preaches like an apostle and he preaches like a pastor and he breaks his heart and he loves them and he rebukes them and he prays for them and he's happy with them and he sheds tears with them and every, every emotion you can imagine because he wanted to get these people to the finish line. He wanted to get these people into heaven. And he realizes that the enemies of the church is the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so Paul writes to them. In this chapter, he's writing something that's a long, that seems a far away from us, but it's really not very far away. You know, this chapter eight is dealing with meat sacrificed to idols. You know, you think, okay, that wasn't on my agenda today. I mean, I was, you know, were you driving down 635 and go, oh, well, I haven't offered my meat sacrifice to idols today. Nobody does that today in our modern day. But isn't it interesting that all scripture is given by inspiration of God? So this has a practical application for us. In fact, if you'll, if you'll look at the last verse of chapter eight, And I can just tell you, I'm not going to get through with this, so I'll probably have to send you my full notes. You say, well, don't I have them there? Well, yeah, kind of. Verse 12 says, but when you, but, uh, (laughs) it's so sad, isn't it? 53-year-old eyes. But anyway, even with my big Bible, sad. But when you thus, uh, this is 12, when you thus sin against the brethren, you wound the weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, 
if food makes my brother stumble. So it's really not about food, is it? I will never eat meat. I will never again eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Not really about meat. That's just kind of what's happening here. Look at, look at your notes here. I want you to fill these in. I'm going to go very quickly. I'm going to have to skip some of this. But we're going to talk about the Lord's direction in the gray areas. The Lord's direction in the gray areas. What, are the gray, what does that mean, Pastor? The gray areas. Those areas where there's no direct command of the Lord about that. But there is a command, and it's, it's woven through this scripture. Look at the introduction, line 5. The Bible plays, write this, a vital role. How many know that? The Bible is central to what we're doing here in this church. I want Trinity Life Church to be centered in the Word of God. My prayer as we move ahead in the days, months, years ahead, that these Wednesday nights will be full as we start going through the attributes of God, going through all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, maybe even, you know, I thought about doing a series on the great characters of the Bible. I even thought about doing something else. I won't even say what it is right here, but uh, it, the Bible is just a vast book. It's vital to our Christian lives. You want your life to count? You want to be effective? Read the Bible. You know that George Mueller read the Bible cover to cover four times a year. Finally, he got to where he wouldn't even read commentaries anymore. Simply read the Bible. He was great in Greek, Hebrew, Latin. And so he would read the Bible. And, and he was just a man of incredible faith. You want faith? Let me ask you this. If you need gas, do you go to, do you go to the sporting goods store or do you go to the gas station? You go to the gas station. Why? You know where to get it. If you don't have faith, I know where to get it. Faith comes, comes, faith comes, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It's vital. Look at this, line six. It's a standard, a blueprint for living. That's right. It's a standard. It's a solid standard. How many things are changing in our culture today? How many things that 40 years ago, 30 years ago was completely wrong and culture even believed that it's wrong? Now it's completely different. Things change. I mean, I can't even imagine how confused our younger generation is. But I can tell you there's a solid standard. Family, marriage, money, morals. Yeah, come on, it's right there. It's that solid stance, a blueprint for living. Skip, skip down to verse 8, our daily living. If you want to be effective servant of Christ, line 9, then, write this, then obedience to God's word is crucial. Obedience to God's word is crucial. Line 10, many Christians, you know what they want? They want God's blessing. How many of you want God's blessing? We pray that prayer. May the Lord bless you. And keep you, etc. We want God's blessing in our lives. But look at look at this. Look at down at verse the highlighted part in verse thir or line thirteen. There are times, however, that questions may arise about certain activities that the Bible does not specifically address. I, I mentioned this last week in some areas. I won't go back to that. We call this the gray areas. Look at line fifteen. The gray areas. Here's what's happening. In Corinth, there, this, there's some things, let me say it this way. There's some things that a Christian can say, well, I don't feel any conscience, a, a pang of conscience about doing this certain thing. And another Christian may feel like if they did that, that was a sin. That's what we call the gray areas. Now, we're talking about something that's not necessarily a sin. The Bible doesn't say it's a sin. We're talking about in a person's heart, in a person's conscience. One person may say, I can do this, and it's not a sin. I don't have any conviction about that, any sense of Holy Spirit conviction there. Another person would say, oh, no, way, wait, wait, I'd really be sinning because I'd, be I'd be violating my conscience. So look at line 20. The issue is this. The issue is that Paul's dealing with eating meats that have been dedicated to idols. Doesn't seem like it is relevant to us, but it's actually very relevant. Look at the next line. Mature Christians, write that. Mature Christians saw nothing wrong with this at all. But how I many know that not all Christians are mature Christians, right? We're all at different maturity levels, and hopefully we're all growing all the time. But look at line 22. New Christians, they had just come out of this life. They, they didn't want any part of that. 
So what's Paul doing? Line 25, Paul provides us with principles about dealing with, write this, questionable practices. Write that, questionable practices. Now I'm going to go through here quickly. First, write this word down. Knowledge, but write this word down. A-N-D. Knowledge and love. So let's read this first verse. Here it is. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know... That we have knowledge. But what does knowledge do? Knowledge, what does it do? Puffs up. That means this. Knowledge without love puffs up. Knowledge is a great thing. Knowledge is a glorious thing. We need knowledge. You need to thirst for knowledge. If I, could, if I could do anything for the young people in this room right now. If I could tell you something that will bless your life in a, in a multiplicity of ways. Become a reader right now. Become a reader right now. It opens up worlds to you. Read. You can read more than just the Bible. Come on. Amen. Read books. I have a historical author that I write, David McCullough. He wrote, you know, the Jonestown, uh, uh, Jones, not Jonestown, the uh, town in Pennsylvania, whatever, that, that had the flood, Johnstown, Johnstown flood, wrote about Roosevelt. Great books. Read those books. Become a reader. Why well, knowledge is great, but but now he's talking about this th- spiritual knowledge. Spiritual knowledge without love. Here's what the Bible says: it puffs up. But what does love do? Shout it out. It, it edifies, and that's what Paul's dealing with here. Look at line 33. Here here it is. Write these words in. Idolatry was rampant in Corinth. Idolatry. Let me explain it to you. It was rampant. In Corinth, it was deeply ingrained in the culture. Here's what would happen: people ate meals in these temples. They ate meals where the the idols were there, and they would sacrifice these meats. They worshipped a variety. Line thirty five: a variety of false gods. In Corinth, if you needed love, you would pray to Athena. If you needed healing, you'd pray to Apollo. Had a god for everything, didn't they? If you needed, if you were going to war, prayed to Ares. If you're a woman and wanted a child, you'd pray to Hera. If you needed protection as a seaman, you pray to Poseidon. The king of all the Greek gods, Zeus. And all these different pagan gods, they worshipped every one of them. And so here's what you would do, line 41. If you were going to a banquet, party, feast, etc., they would sacrifice to one of these gods. They wanted to... Honor one of these gods. It was just common. It's just what they, it's what they did. But here's the issue. Now, here's the issue in Corinth. Look at this little illustration. I put it down there for you so you could read through this and get more out of it. But I want you to think about their mindset. Why was this an issue? Here it is. Look at it. Line 44. They believed that the air was filled with demonic spirits. Demonic spirits. That they were trying to get inside their bodies. They felt that the easiest way for a demon to get in their body was to attach itself to food. So the logical thing in their confused mind was, when, I, when the demon's attached to the food, it's been sacrificed to the deal. And then if I eat it, the demon's going to get inside of me. So what did they do? They would dedicate it to their God. Their God would conquer the demon, cleanse the food. Very confused. But that was what it was. Here's what would happen. Line 50. Meat would be offered by, on a pagan altar by a presiding priest, and they would apportion the meat. Look at this. Write this. Three ways. How many ways? Three. three ways. First of all, there was a portion that was offered up and burned to the gods, Zeus, Ares, whatever. The second portion was consumed by the one that was the offer, the one offering. But then there was this third portion of the offering. It was thirds. That would be the priest. He would get that. That would, be to, that would kind of be his salary. He would either take it and eat it. He would take his family and, and, and give it to his family. Or if he had extra, here's what he would do. He would go down to the market and he would sell it. And the people in the community would buy it because why? Look at this, line 56. It was cheaper. Everybody's looking for a bargain, right? So they would get the cheap meat. They would take it to their homes. Line 59, the problem. 
the problem surface in the church with the fact that some Christians believe that the meat was contaminated. They believe that eating this meat was an act of worship, participating in the worship. They didn't want any kind of association with these idols. They just come out of that. They didn't want to go back to that. Line 65, the fruit brought back memories of their old lifestyles. I mean, we don't want to go back to our old lifestyles. They would think that some of the people in the community, oh, there they are. They're, they're worshiping idols again, you see. So what happened? Line 69, look at it, created tension in the church. So what, what are we going to do with this? Here's what Paul's saying, line 71. He's trying to stress there needs to be a balance between what? Knowledge and love. He's showing them the answer to all of this. Here's, and I just read verse 1 to you, line 72. The apostle states that all had knowledge. What kind of knowledge? What knowledge is all? The knowledge that there is only one God. And the fact that idols are powerless and they're worthless. And they're actually nothing. An idol is nothing. A stone idol is nothing. A wood idol is nothing. When you're offering to that, I mean, you may be offering to demons because they promote that. But in itself, it's nothing. There's only one God. There's no other God in the universe but one God. All those other gods are not really gods. They're just demon spirits promoting things. But he says they're nothing. And Paul is talking about that knowledge. The knowledge that I know as a Christian. Here, now look at me. I know as a Christian in Corinth, first century, that if I ate meat sacrificed to an idol, it wasn't going to contaminate me. It was just food. That's the knowledge I have. And the mature Christian said, it's me. It's not, nothing getting in me. I, the Holy Ghost is in me. But there were others in the church, probably new believers, that had an issue with this. It was wounding to their conscience. It was influencing them in the right way. And what's the principle? What did Paul say at the end? I'd never eat meat again. It, you know, that's no big deal to me. I'm going to lay that aside as the mature Christian. But the one with knowledge, knowledge what? Puffs up. He'll just run roughshod over that and won't consider. See what I'm saying? Some things are not wrong. But if it's going to be a big deal to someone, I just, it's not a big deal to me. I just won't do it, right? You see, see the flow here. Talking about a mature church, maturity. Look at line 75, because I know if I leave something undone here, you're going to, oh, you'll be, tonight you'll be going, oh, no, he didn't give me that one. Line 75, then this kind of knowledge would free the conscience. The knowledge that a God, an idol is nothing. It would free, the mature person had a free conscience. Look at line 77. They knew that the food was dedicated to idol, was not N-O-T, contaminated. He false God didn't exist. But notice 79, lighter part. Others, however, didn't understand that truth. So this is it. This is where knowledge must be balanced with truth. Knowledge is a great thing. But if you have knowledge and you don't balance it with love and consideration for others in these gray areas, then the Paul said, you're puffed up. That's what knowledge does without love. It, lo, notice, knowledge puffs up, but charity, which is love, edifies. Look at the second thing quickly. The effect, E-F-F-E-C-T, the effect of knowledge without love. We're going to see it here, verse 2 and 3. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, as yet he ought to know. Verse 3. But if anyone loves God... This one is known by him. In other words, knowing God doesn't just mean I know a lot of facts about God. It means I've experienced God. He's filled my life with grace and mercy and love. See that, beloved, come on, let us love one another, right? Love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for you don't know this? For God is love. Be okay, we could do the motions, couldn't we? Now, I don't want to break out in Father Abraham. We don't have time, you know. <laughs> he had many sons. See, look at this verse again, verse 3. But if anyone loves God, this one, everyone say this one. This one is known. 
by him. He, he really has a relationship with God. Listen to what he's saying. You understand here, you, when I started saying, I'm going to talk about meat sacrifice to idols, you, you, you kind of went, what? Don't you know the pressure on my life? Don't you know I've got struggles in my life? Pastor, you're going to come in here and talk about meat sacrifice to idols? What's that going to do for me? It's more than that. There's a spiritual principle that can help Trinity Life Church. And that's it. If you're locked up and sock full of knowledge, but it doesn't balance out with God's grace. He said the one who really knows God is basically this. The one that has the knowledge of God, but it knows God, is full of God. Paraphrasing. Look at 91. Line 91. Note, pride, P-R-I-D-E. Pride can get us into trouble. Pride creates trouble. T-R-O-U-B-L-E created trouble in the Corinthian church. Line 95, he knows nothing. Our society is filled with people who claim to know it all. But in reality, they don't know anything. Amen. Look at line 97. Third, one God. Everybody say one God. He is the cause. C-A-U-S-E. He is the cause of our lives. Let's read these verses. Look on the screen. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols... We know that an idol is what? It's nothing in the world. An idol is nothing. And, there, and that there is no God, no other God, but one God. But one. God but one. Verse 5. For even if there are so-called, so-called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, there are many gods, many lords in the world. I've mentioned some to you. Yet for us, there is one God and Father. For us. How about you, Trinity Life? One God for us, God the Father. Now notice this, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ. I love to mention his name in this pulpit. The Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we. You know the, the, the original doesn't have the live on the end? It's in italics, and it's, it really reads, through whom we we exist through him. Paul says, idols are nothing. Line 106. There's only one God. One God. All things through him. Not Buddha, Allah, Hindu gods. We were in India several years ago. So many gods. Jason, you were there with me. I was so worn out with those gods. That, that warfare was so heavy there. So tired. I came back. took me two weeks to get over it. You, you saw me. I preached there. We, you prayed for the sick there. Heavy spiritual atmosphere there. God's everywhere. You can't drive 100 yards without a little God on the side of the road. They're, they are not gods. There's one God. His name is Jesus. God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. Line 110. He is before all things. Well, I need to preach through Colossians. He, do you know there's no book in the Bible that exalts Christ like Colossians does? You know the theme of Colossians? It's, I'm, I'm a dirt road here, and I, I've got, I'm already past time. But you know what? Hey, I've never not been past time. Oh, glory to God. The theme of Colossians is the Christ of the church. Theme of Ephesians, the church of Jesus Christ. Look at this, 17. Colossians 1, 17. He is before all things, hallelujah, and in him all things consist. God made us, and the purpose of our lives is to live for him. That's why you were created. Oh, I feel so sorry. My heart breaks, more than sorry. I don't, I don't, I, I, my heart breaks for people that don't know our Savior, because that's why we were created, to know him, to serve him. We need to worship him. David Livingston walked over 29,000 miles. He had a motto. Look at this motto. He said this, send me anywhere, only go with me. He said, lay any burden on me, only sustain me, Lord. Sever me from any tie, but the tie that binds me to your service and to your heart. He said, we're created for gods, not idols. Fourth, line 122. Fourth, the conscience and idols. The conscience 
and idols. Here it is. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge, Paul says. For some, with consciousness of the idol until now, eat as a thing offered to an idol. In other words, they, they, they're just come out of sin and they're saved. They still think that idol's real. They don't have the knowledge yet that there's only one God and all those gods don't even exist. There's one God, one creator, one father, one son, one Holy Spirit, one God in three. And their conscience being weak is defiled. But food does not condemn us to God. Neither if we eat are we better, nor if we do not eat are we worse. You see that? Notice what he's saying in context of Corinth. If you eat meat sacrificed to idols, you're not better or worse. It doesn't bring you closer to God. It won't take you away from God. Only Jesus can bring us to God. Only the Holy Spirit can bring Only God can bring us to God. Not meat. So what's happening? Line 28, doubt and confusion. I'm going to skip all the way down to 140. Here's, the, here's what I want you to see because I'm going to give these and we'll close. Hear this. Fifth, a caution, C-A-U-T-I-O-N, a caution about our liberty in Christ. Here's the caution. And we can be puffed up with knowledge and say, well, that's what the Bible says. Well, we're talking about the gray areas. Now, there's many areas that are not gray. But there's many areas that we're like, okay, we got to toe the line here. Understand, we're talking about gray areas. Now, look at this. Verse 9. But beware. Here's the caution. Lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idle temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you thus, notice, when you thus sin against the brethren and, wing, and wound their weak conscience... You sin against Christ. There, no, here it is. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat, it again, eat meat again, lest I make my brother stumble. Now, here it is. Even though we know that pagan gods do not exist, the food sacrificed to them will not harm us. They will not help us. Paul offers a caution hear about the liberty, our liberty in Christ. He tells us to be on guard against, listen, against causing the weak brother or the sister to spiritually stumble and be ruined, ruined by their actions. So here's how we deal with gray areas. Here's how we deal with areas that would not be a sin for you to commit. And I could name several areas. I won't do it tonight, but this is an area that you could do this, but you realize it may make a weaker brother or sister stumble. So Paul says, the mature Christian says, well, I just won't do that. It's not a big deal. I won't do that because my brother or my sister is more important than that. And in the next chapter, Paul's going to talk about the sacrifices that he made because of the church. So here, look at this with me. Now, I'm going to give you these. I'm going to keep you just for these. I'm going to let you go. Now, if you'll notice here, I have kind of a bibliography in the, in the bottom of the page, the very back bottom. Those are commentaries that I've worked through. Those are study things. Now, some of those are kind of expensive, so you probably won't be getting them. But if you, you may want to look at those. If you could get those at like a cheaper place, great studies. Great studies. So I'll put those there for you. Here, let's look at line 154, and we'll finish this. Biblical principles that should govern our actions. Pastor, how do I know what to do when there's no command? When, when, when the gray areas, here's, here's how you make those decisions. First principle is this, the principle of exaltation. Will it glorify Jesus? I mean, no, that's top shelf right there. Will it glorify the Lord? Would I be ashamed to do this activity with Jesus? Whether we eat or drink, it says, whatever you do, do all because I want to do it. Right? No? Did I misquote that? Whatever you do in word or deed, do it because I've got my rights. I'm an American Christian. 
No, to the glory of God. Second principle is the principle of excess, E-X-C-E-S-S, excess. Is this activity really necessary? Okay, is, is it really necessary? Is it all that important? Look at, verse, look at Hebrews. Laying aside every weight in sin and the sin which does so easily beset us, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Will it be a hindrance? Is it excess? Number three principle, edification. The principle of edification. Will the activity help me grow spiritually or will it hurt my walk with God? Or will it hurt somebody else's walk with God? 1023, we'll get into this later, but all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. And that just simply means helpful. All things are lawful. There's things that are gray areas. They're not, they're not a violation of the word of God to do them. But think about this. Is it expedient? Or, or will it edify, rather? Principle of example, number four. Line 171. Principle of example. Do my actions set an example to others for others to follow? Look at, this is a great one for the young men and women that are here tonight. 1 Timothy 4.12 is a great verse. You young folks tonight, you need to memorize this verse. I'm going to test you next week, okay? You're going to get a test. Here it is. Let no man despise your youth. You say, I'm young. What can I do for God? David killed Goliath. Come on, right? Right, guys? You can do a lot. We need you. Be an example to the believer's word, conversation, charity, spirit, truth. So it's, how do I make a decision on great areas? Will I be a good example doing this? Fifth, the principle of expediency. There it is. Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, that not all things are expedient. That means helpful. Are my actions helpful? Will my actions build? Will they be useful in building others up? Or will it stumble or defend, etc.? Last one is this, the principle of evangelism. Will my testimony be damaged by this? Will people who, know I, uh, who, who do not know the Lord as their Savior be drawn to Christ, or will they be repulsed by it? Here's the word. Wisd- walk in wisdom toward those that are without redeeming the time. So meat sacrifice to idols, so far away, seems so irrelevant. Not really, is it? Seems like that's relevant, doesn't it? Because there's things that we have choices on that you and I need to take these principles to say, yes, I have a right to do that. Not going to be a sin for me. Not going to violate my conscience. Ah, oh, but you know what? I'm going to leave that off. I don't need to do that. It may affect others in the wrong way. Paul said, if, that's the, if it's going to affect someone in a negative way, he said, I'll never do it. The wor- till the world doesn't stand anymore, I'll never do that. Why? Because I care about the body of Christ. Amen. So what is it? It's the higher law of God's grace and love. Amen. Let's stand. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you today. We bless you. Lord, your people have come to this place on this night. Worked a long day. Many of them have gotten up early, Lord. I'm so grateful. They have sat in here attentive, hungry for your precious word. Father, I pray this evening that you would, as we move through this book, as tonight, taking large steps, large portions in the word of God, that you would teach us something here. Lord, we don't live in first century Corinth. We don't offer meat sacrifice to idols. But, Lord, there are choices that we can make that can weaken someone's conscience. Help us to be good examples in all that we do. When we failed you, forgive us, Lord. Help us to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. And right now, Lord, I pray that you would let Trinity Life Church be a church that's growing spiritually, growing in the Word of God, moving along at the pace that you have for us in the Spirit. Father, we just love you. We praise you. I pray a blessing on each person. I pray you bring us to this place Sunday with expectation of great times in your presence. And Lord, we ask that between now and Sunday we get miracles, that your name would be glorified, and that you would let your will fall into place for us as your people. Let thy will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. And for this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless each of you tonight. So good to see you.